Hey there, it's time for the show, the Tatiana Show, where you make friends and talk life and crypto. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tatiana Show. Josh is at a holiday party right now, probably having some eggnog and other fun activities without the appropriate social distancing spreading COVID all around Berlin. Um, so I am here to talk to you guys from my apartment, which I'm changing up the look of the place. Now I think it looks a little bit bland. I thought it would look like a Ikea ad or, you know, like an Apple documentary, but it just looks blah. Um, I'm excited today because I'm bringing on a libertarian legend, uh, Pete Quinones, uh, who is known as man's raider and i don't know why that is can you tell me what that's what that's about welcome to the tatiana show thank you uh well when i first started this i have a corporate job i don't look like i would be i have a corporate job but i actually have a corporate job and um my company is international uh, i've told i've said before they're based in germany and they've been on this woke crap for 20 years so um yeah when i decided to start a podcast and start writing, I felt that it was probably a good idea to do it under an assumed name because I knew people would probably be upset by some of the things I have to say. I mean, you just have a regular opinion today and people get upset by it. So I, I went by that for a while. And then you know, it just got to the point where I had to use my real name for purposes of being a part of a, a nonprofit and everything. So my name would have been out there anyway. And I just went to my company and I sat down with the uh, with the North American director and I said, look, this is what I do. Listen to this podcast. It's probably the worst thing I've ever put out. And um, he's like, all right, there's no problem. Is, um, you know, as long as <laughs> as long as we don't have to run interference from Germany, we should be fine. So, uh, you yeah, know, that's that's one of the reasons why I stayed. Uh, stayed anonymous at first or student anonymous at first. So you must be very, very terrible. And I'm being kind of joker, right? Because it does seem like these days uh, you have to almost apologize if you have any kind of libertarian or actual anarchist, not like Antifa, like a real ANCAP kind of leanings. Um, I always feel like I'm about to expose to people like my hidden Nazi past, which there isn't one, but like that is the reaction that I'm expecting from people. And I have to take a minute to think about it. And I say, well, no, I, I don't even do anything weird. I don't, you know, I, I don't think I go bananas or anything, but it's, it's unfortunate that there's a predictable frame of what politics you're allowed to have, especially for a work environment where, so they basically just got over it and now you just use it from time to time for a funny. Oh yeah. Every once in a while, just throw it in there or people, m m a lot of other people use it. Um, you know, will still call me that. I mean, I have friends, people that I've met in, in real life that, um, th that still call me that because of, you know, everything. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, real Nazi, Nazi background, dad's Puerto Rican, uh, from a line of Sephardic Jews and, um, you know, mom's Polish and Russian, the Russian side is Ashkenazi Jews. And, you know, we're, yeah, you know, we're real Nazis, but, you know, I'm, I, I don't, people are just I, I mean i was right up until the time we were recording i had somebody on on online just screaming at me you know how you know i was a hateful bigot and i was all right and everything because i'm not because i'm going to make fun of somebody if they have pronouns in their bio it just if i meet someone in real life and they say this is my preferred pronoun yeah i'm going to use it okay i'm going to i'm going to be i'm going to be the nicest guy but if you're a dick online and you and you have that in your bio. I'm going to use it against you because you're a dick online, and you're being a dick against me. You're being a dick to me for no reason. So I mean, I don't. Our lives don't know. have really devolved in the time of COVID. We can't even have in-person arguments where we can insult each other, you know, right to each other's faces. We're we're stuck being behind lines. Um, so you've been involved with the Libertarian Institute for a long time, right? Um, that's a really cool organization. I, um, I would love everybody to check it out. Scott Horton has come on the Tatiana show several times and he's obviously quite involved there. Um, there's been a lot of changes though this year with COVID, right? And people are very, you know, apt to dispose of their libertarian leanings. They don't like freedom anymore. They want us all to wear a mask. And 
a lot of people have had different reactions to it, right? I would think that people should be a little bit more consistent and believe in liberty at all times. Some people think that this is the time to mask everybody up and, you know, tighten the news. Uh, tell me and the audience a little bit about your outlook on this and, and what you've been doing to kind of express your opinion on this, because everybody's got one on it. Well, I, I had a lot of changes this year, too. Um, yeah, th this radicalized me a lot. Um, I, I don't really consider I don't call myself a libertarian anymore. If people want to re keep referring to me, that that's fine. I don't even call myself an anarchist anymore. Um, I'm I just want to be left alone. And this year has shown me that it's not going to happen. They're not going to leave us alone. And a good large portion of the populace are collaborators with them. And I think that it has reached a point where, yeah, I mean, I really question, I've written articles about the non-aggression principle where it's just not, it, it seems like a suicide pact where you may have to you may have to aggress against people to stop them you know if you know that they're if you know they're plotting something against you and um yeah i just i think we're at a point right now that the population will i i've you see videos of just nor regular people assaulting other people because they're choosing not to wear a mask you see riots in the street all year and it's just I, I don't know that it seems to me that if libertarian ideals and the ideology has been around for so long that it would have taken hold a little bit and it seems to have not been able to even pierce the overton window to inspire people to look at things a different way and i'm not saying i mean I still hold to libertarian ideals. I want to be left alone. Um, and I think that's the most important. And I don't want to aggress against other people. But I think this year is ramping us up to a showdown that we might have to be ready for. And I don't know what that is, but it definitely seems like the state, and especially the state under Joe Biden, is going to be try to be more invasive in our lives. And if people don't come together and really fight against it and have a mass kind of resistance to it, there's going to be real problems and there could be real violence. I mean, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the pansy violence of, of Antifa. I'm talking about the people that are going to resist this all own guns and things could, things could get really bad if they decide that, um, you know, 50 to 70 million of them already think uh, an election got stolen from them. Yeah, that's a big deal if you believe in elections. You know, when I when I went through the Ron Paul movement in 2012, he was my guy. I did everything I could, uh, you know, traveling around the country. Yeah, we're going to win. And then when I saw how rigged that was, and I basically didn't care in 2016. I was lucky. I, I could care less. And so I missed all of the action with Hillary versus Donald. And what I've noticed by this round and, and by that round, though, is that it seems like they took the righteous libertarian feelings that people from the left and the right really resonated with. I mean, I'm sure you were at some of these rallies where you would have thousands of people showing up for Ron Paul. Um, and they were not just, you know, right wingers or something. It was it was a really good uh, blend. I feel like Trump took that love of liberty and then kind of made it almost like a neocon statist weird flavor with you know he he likes to he likes to act like he's the peace president and comparatively he is but he's not mr peace president as i learned when scott was on the show a couple of weeks ago and basically was giving me the hardcore lesson on that um do you think that people are going to find their way back to liberty and do you think that even elections are going to be an option because now all these normies are getting red pilled. And sometimes I would almost venture to say that Donald Trump has woken up more people than Ron Paul, which I love Ron Paul, forget stupid Trump. I love Ron Paul more. But the fact that during this whole Trump era, they've all been accustomed to hearing an anti-war message and touting that. 
They've gotten used to making fun of the media, which is awesome. Great. Uh, government spending, not great, you know, but I guess they know that they're not supposed to do that. Plus, they've seen the ineptitude of the government. So that's wonderful because now they say, wow, life with them in charge would be just one big DMV. Um, what do you think is the future of even elections? And do you think that Trump is going to take this one home or do you care? Or what do you think? Well, I mean, I think that Biden's going to be installed on the 20th of January. The thing with the election is if you have, I mean, if 40 million people or 50 million people are really serious about the fact that they feel like this got stolen from them, that is a huge red pill. But the question that has to be asked, do they still not believe in the system? You know, you can listen to some like really red pilled leftists like Jimmy Dore, who will say, or like um, the guys from like System of a Down, like Surge from System of a Down. He's like been putting out albums talking about how the government is basically a terrorist organization, but he wants it to handle his health care. Yeah, I mean, so- I don't know why they can't figure that out. What is wrong? Is everybody like, I don't mean to call them stupid, but where is the logic in this? Like, I can't tell why they can't add things up. And it's very disturbing that people are just unable to think. Is this a public education thing? Am I just overexpecting intelligence out of my fellow man? Well, I think it's an ego thing. I think that a lot of people think that if they get it, it, well, if we just get the, if we got the right person in there kind of thing, if we can get someone who thinks like me in there, then things will be different. And that just goes to show that they don't understand the nature of politics. I was looking at a a tweet this morning that Jacobin had put out. And anyone who knows the history of Jacobin is like, okay, you picked that name. Okay, that sends a message. Okay, okay, I like it. I like it. That's pretty bold. Um, And they put out a tweet saying that they shouldn't vote on, um, they they shouldn't do a vote. They should be centralizing the power to themselves and get AOC to centralize power so that they can get health care for all. And then Jimmy Dore responded and um, with something that was like completely blue pilled. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, okay, the Jacobin people understand political power. When you get political power, the goal isn't to use it to help people. The goal is to get more power and to centralize more power to yourself. And usually the left understands that. And, and the Wait, people what's a Jacobin? I don't understand what this Jacobin thing is. Uh, the, well, the Jacobins were, uh, well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now, but French Revolution, look them up. They were brutal. Right, the old reference. When people, I think, are now referencing it again, are they just trying to bring back that spirit? Yeah, I, think, I think they just wanted to use a, um, you know, use something to trigger people, something to, to get... You know, it'd be like, like when the Young Turks you chose the Young Turks. It's like, well, what were the Young the Young Turks committed genocide? So you know, it's like th- these far these leftists, you know, they pick a name so that they could trigger people. You know, people who are in the know. But the whole thing about political power, and this is one of the problems that the main problem I have with the Libertarian Party is when you get political power, the goal is to get more political power, is to centralize that power, so you can do whatever the hell you want. The right never does that. The left does it all the time. And the left has always done it. They control the culture. They control the deep state. They control the universities. And they control the press. The right doesn't control anything. They don't control the culture at all. And what I'm seeing, to get back to your question, is you have all these you know, 50 to 70 million people who are getting red pilled, but I don't know whether they're ready to step outside the system, which is you know why I've been writing articles saying the Libertarian Party needs to go after these people. And the message to them needs to be the system can't work. The system needs to be burned to the ground. So come over and be with us and let's just throw bombs all friggin' day in the press, you know, get on whatever shows we can till the point that they can't ignore us. And all we're doing is calling them out as a terrorist organization, as as a corrupt organization. And I mean, I think that that should be if if the party was going to do anything and say we will we will um, ally with anyone, we will ally with anyone who agrees that. It, what is going on needs to stop. and But I don't think, I'm hoping and I'm seeing signs that that may happen. But um, 
it ha- it has to happen quick because who knows over the next year who these disaffected voters may you know they may split off and try to start their own party they may just who knows but i think time is of the essence when it comes to that because these people right now are ripe they are they are open wounds and you have to be able to step in and heal them show them how to heal it yeah i think uh it's definitely an interesting time. So I, I don't hate Trump. I find him entertaining. I'm not going to lie. I think that compared to what else are the options, you know, he's definitely my guy. But I'm not that excited about the Trump stuff, right? Um, but I went this weekend. I went to the Stop the Steal because I think that the election was was stolen. Did you have an opinion on that? I'm curious. Nope. Do you feel? No, no opinion. I'm staying out of that. Okay, I'm gonna, that's fair. I'm, gonna, I'm waiting for the. Um, I don't care about every election's been stolen. There's been irregularities in every election. There are always irregularities in every election. I'm waiting. I want to see the attitude of the people who feel who you know the, are upset about it, so that I can figure out how I need to talk to them. Yeah. So the, to me, the whole thing of the steal, I don't care. You know, I mean, Biden presidency, Trump presidency, they're going to be two different presidencies, but they're still going to be, you know, just popcorn, just eating popcorn and watching. But I want to see where it's going to go and what people's attitudes are so that I can cater a message to them. That's more important to me right now than whoever is going to be in that office. Okay, fair. Um, Okay, so let me go on with my where I'm going with this. So I went to D.C. this weekend, right? And I was just going to go and hang out. But it turns out a female friend of mine was going and so was another friend of mine. And so I joined up with them. But the female friend is the girlfriend of a very high up proud boy, right? I'm trying to be very vague about this, right? And and I was like, oh, I heard about the proud boys. Whenever anybody talks about all right stuff, I'm just like, oh, whatever. I don't even care what you idiots have to say about anything, basically. So I don't pay attention. And I also feel like a lot of these people are vilified. You know, I, I played the deplorable many years ago when Trump was inaugurated and everybody was telling me, don't do it. There's going to be racist. I'm like, well, then they need the message of freedom more than anybody. Like, you know, these are people that I could, you know, bring over to my side. So anyway, so I went to the to the Proud Boys March with her, right? But and, can, I, can I stop you for a second? Yeah. If that ball that you played was radical commie leftists, your friends wouldn't have said anything. Oh, yeah. It's because they were right wing. Yeah, that's because, true. Because the left, the left isn't bad. They're just misguided. The right is bad and evil. And, and we need to get that you know, out of I mean, they're both evil. I mean, the left is the left is not more evil. They're more devious. They're better at they're better at power. They're better at getting their way. So, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, well, they're <laughs> both pretty evil as far as I'm yeah. concerned, because they're both status, right? So I went, right? And I'm like, all right, I want to see what's going to happen. I got nothing else to do. God knows you can't do anything. So I go to this thing. And first of all, it was the biggest display of testosterone I have witnessed in years. It was a bunch of dudes, you know, like when you let a dog outside for the first time in a long time and the dog is like outside and jumping and happy as hell, like you can't like stop its joy. This is what all these men were like. They were all pent up dudes. And for the record, there's a lot of like black people. There's like people of color, whatever. There's all different kinds of people. It's not just a bunch of whiteies, like, you know, with Nazi mustaches. And so the main guy or one of the main guys gets up there and he says, you know, we're not going to start a fight. But if the fight's going to come to us, we're going to finish them. Rawr! And so they kind of went out there like marauders, okay? And they were just looking for problems with Antifa. And normally, I don't really like violence as a solution to anything. But after watching everybody take it all year long and just be like, man, they all close my business, they're okay, I don't mind, me. I'll kill myself, no problem, sorry, government. I was really happy to see their aggression. And I'm just wondering, like, what do you think about that pent up um, maleness, right? That's been essentially, you know, bad boys, stop having any kind of feelings, right? And are these guys going to turn into 
um, something that's helpful for the cause of freedom? Like, are they the 1776, you know, revolution guys, or are they something that are going to potentially just result in more statism? Because I didn't feel that all of them were pro-state. I felt like they were, you know, a little bit more like us, for lack of a better uh, explanation. I didn't think that they were only drinking the Trump Kool-Aid. But people loved them. And that's the other thing, just for the record, like the cops, they didn't mess with them. They didn't mess with the cops. They didn't really care for the cops that much. They weren't like bootlickers or however you would say. But then also a bunch of random ladies, man, the ladies loved the Proud Boys. They were like, oh, thank you so much. We love you. I mean, they were flirting with them. I was like, all right, ladies, keep it together. And they were very nice. Yeah, well, how often do women see a real man anymore? A man acting, or maybe not even, maybe not even a real man, but just a man who acts masculine. It's. I think that that was a really key component. Yeah, it was an interesting thing. Like, definitely some weird vibes at certain points. But I was very happy to be. And the thing is, is that they wanted us to be in the center of the group. So if there was any kind of scuffles, it would only pick off the men on the outside. So we were going to be in the center. I mean. Damn, I loved it. I was like, yeah, I'm a little pony. Put me in the middle. I'm so special, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. It was such a it was such an interesting experience. I'm still kind of like processing through it. But do you think that marches like that are going to cause more violence? Like you're talking about one team eventually getting frustrated. Is that an extension of the Proud Boys? Should we be worried that they will be, you know, crushed by the state as well? Like what are your thoughts around that? Well, I think if they're perceived and reported as being far right, you know, that's not good. But as far as violence goes, I mean, I want to see more. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's part of my plan. Um, in order, the as far as I'm concerned, the only way, the only solution to liberty is separation, is that the country needs to split up. States need to split up. And the only way that's going to happen is if things get so bad that the over to, that secession and decentralization crack the Overton window. Do you really think that the South in, because I feel like in the North, I'm in Jersey, right? And so I'm in Wussy Town. Uh, you know, the best I got is this lady, Tina Forty, who's my favorite thing. She's this like Bronx lady who's got She's this really big accent. She's insane. I love her. Are you kidding me? She's, she's, like, she's, she's, ab she's absolutely insane. And she wants to sell socks. But her socks are $18, which I thought was very expensive. Um, no, I ran into her. I like her. I like her aggression. And, and it kind of touches on what you were saying. Like women don't experience men being aggressive. And I, as a woman, have a tendency of leaning into male energy just because like I'm like ambitious, I guess. But I would prefer not to have to do that. Um, nonetheless, when she does it, I'm like, all right, at least somebody's saying something. That's right, Tina, you tell them, you know, she just goes bananas. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. Keep cussing. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So yeah, there's all these angry people. You think people are going to take up arms if they're comes push up, comes to shove because they've been shoving. I don't know that they would take up arms against their own people, but they would see the UN as an invading army. I okay. Mean, that's the way I would see the UN. I would see the UN as an invading army and I would just start shooting. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're not going to put up with that. I mean, we put up with the cops already. You know, we put up with, um, you know, I just did an episode on the Boston Marathon bombing and people forget that a major U.S. city, one of the oldest cities, was on, had martial law and there were 9,000 troops going door to door in, in Boston. And... I don't know that Americans are ready to, you know, to take up arms against their own people, but, um, you know, the UN, but I mean, I don't even think the UN would do that. I mean, I, th that would be really stupid, but the, um, yeah, I still think that things need to get worse. And when you, I all know that there's hope when on the nightly news, they're talking about, yeah, you know, secession might not be a bad idea. And I that, can't imagine them letting secession go down. Why would they let their tax cows go away? They love their power. They're evil overlords. How could they be evil overlords as their land dwindles? They need more land, <laughs> the, you know, a feeding itself monster. Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you have violence every night on the TV 
that's not see all the violence that we saw this year was excused um when you start if what they deem as right wing and they'll deem it as far right even nazi if that violence is starting to happen and they don't you know send in the military or send in the national guard to put it down or something like that i mean, I, I just don't see how they can't start talking about that because Optics is very important to these people. And if you start seeing battles in the street, they're a laughing stock to their friends around the world, especially their friends in Europe. So, I mean, I just don't see how I don't see how in my lifetime there isn't at least one state that just says bye. And I, I don't I, think I, they're going to let them out. I mean, maybe. I actually believe we would have had a better chance of that happening with Trump than with Biden, because I think that if a left state wanted to do it, it would be a lot easier for them to allow a left state to do it. But if Biden you know, goes after guns, which I don't think he's going to, it, I, I don't think I think he's going to pass a bunch of law, you know, a, a bunch of executive orders that. Um, people are just going to, states are just going to ignore and everything. But I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't, people said, oh, if Biden gets elected, you know, there won't be any more riot, you know, there won't be any more rioting. And I mean, you, well, no, you're just not hearing it now. You know, like Portland is still a mess and, you know, Seattle is still a mess. And, you know, look at Staten Island. Staten Island has stores, businesses that have, cons um, are declaring themselves um, autonomous zones. I mean, th this is the kind of stuff that if you if you want to see real change, you need a lot more of that. You know, people will people will listen, and people will, especially if you have loud voices getting that me who can deliver that message in a coherent way, where it's like, yeah, you know, it's like you know, right wingers need to be reminded of what they celebrate every July 4th, which is secession. And, um, you know, left-wingers just need to uh, be ridiculed, <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> they just need to be made, uh, to me, whenever I encounter a left-winger and get, get attacked by one, I just act, my assumption is, and the way I act towards them is, oh, you're an insane person. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, what can I do? How can I help you? Do you but need... do you think that's a shitty attitude? No. You know what I mean? Like if you're trying, okay. So no. before I, don't, I used to I want, want separa bridge I people. want separation. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want a conversation with these people. These people are insane. They want to tell me what to do. They want to tell me how to run my life, and they want to use the government in order to do it. No, these are people are my enemy. Full stop. That's fair. I mean, I there have been different points where as a musician, you know, I want to bring together people from the left and the right, right? But now I am very against um, the masks and against the lockdown. And it's come to a point where I no longer want to help them into the light. I want to kick their asses a little bit because as far as I can tell, they are trying to suppress me and society is trying to give me some BS that they're the polite ones and I'm out, I'm unruly for not wanting to wear a freaking face mask. And I'm not interested in that. And to me, people may think that this is a, an over-exaggeration, but when you say, oh, it's just a little armband, you know, no big deal, Jew bag, it's cool, just wear that. Like, this is what this is akin to because it's a symbolic muzzle. How dare anyone tell me what to put over my effing mouth, period. I will bite your effing hand off. Like I'm angry about it. And it's very hard to, you know, maintain some kind of like, because you don't want your civility and your, and your humanity to be robbed by these MFers, right? So you still want to treat people with some compassion and like a human being and not be divided by the tools that they use to divide us. But it's also getting very serious where like you kind of have to be a little bit less tolerant. So I understand what you mean about wanting to be separate from them. Um, I don't know if that will be permitted, you know, because those are not the productive people of society. Let's say they want to split it up, you know, team Republican, which is like wank, wank, whatever, Republicans, eh, you know, they would be at least the producers. And then you've got the 
the liberal arts degree people on the left complaining and and there's a competition between who's who's the biggest uh, loser so they can get the biggest uh, chunky chunk of, of change so I don't know like I, I don't know how viable a real secession would be in that regard um, I got to bring back Michael Bolden and the Tenth Amendment Center guys uh, to talk a little bit about nullification and and maybe I don't know like uh, Scott Horton was saying that Texas could never secede because they've got that big military base in there what do you think? Yeah. Fort Hood's right up the right up the uh, road from uh, Austin. So, I mean, sure. I mean, but what if the soldiers were on the side of the Texans? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a great assumption. The more soldiers that I meet, and and there's a lot that leave the leave the military and go to be, become anarchists and voluntarists. And there's a lot of podcasts now with uh, veterans. I, I don't know that. I think it's going to be really hard to get these people to, I mean, especially the military now. I mean, you know, when you have a voluntary military, sure, there are a lot of people in there who want to be in, you know, who want to be in there and want to fight. But there's a lot of people in there now who are just in there because they want college or they want, they had no other options. My cousin went in there after having three master's degrees that he couldn't use. And he's not in there to fight. You know, he, he's not going to if if they said, oh, you have to turn your gun on an American, he'd be like, get the hell out of here. Just shoot me. You know, so, I mean, I don't really know that there I'd be more worried about the police and not really local cops, but state cops. Um, but, you know, who knows? I, I just don't think that. I think that a lot of people are seeing the writing on the wall. I think a lot of right wingers this year got red pilled on the police. I think a lot of right wingers got red pilled on the police. And I think it would have been a lot better if in the wake of the George Floyd protest, if they hadn't had the riots and the looting. But of course, they're going to have the riots and the looting. Even if peaceful protests, you have to put um, taint agents out there. You have to put people who are going to be able to deflect the narrative away from, you know, authority how terrible authority is and how and how terrible policing is in this country to have. Um, and as soon as, you know, most people fear the mob more than they fear the government. And rightly so. The government has an interest in not killing people, you know, in not killing people en masse. And but the mob doesn't. The mob is like, oh, we're going to do whatever we want. And we're just going to be. And then you have that mob mentality. Um, I can't remember who wrote the book, but this book, The Mob, um, uh, um, I can't remember what it is, but it was like it's this book on mob mentality on on the mentality of the mob from uh, the early 20th century that allegedly Hitler, Mussolini, all of them read. And, you know, they were like, OK, this is how you control the mob. And when you look at the mob, when you look at that mob, it was like, you know, people in Portland were like literally like, please send the feds in because the Portland police aren't doing anything. I mean, they're begging for it. And how can you blame them? Their businesses are being tore, uh, burned down. I had people that, you know, people who listen to my podcast tell me th these mobs are right down the street from me in Portland. And if they come here, you know, we're going to get in trouble if we protect our own property. What the hell do I do? You know, so I think I think a lot of people got red pilled on the police this year. I would hope it would be more. But um, and boomers are the worst. I mean, they're just. God, you're not going to change your mind. We're just going to have to, I mean, I hate to say it, wait for them to die off. Um, so wait a second. Now, usually I am very critical of the police, right? But you bring up a good point. You know, they're terrorizing the, the uh, Antifa maniacs. Um, they're just going around, trashing stuff, burning stuff down. Cops are like, no problem, man. And so that's very, very disturbing. Then you are also seeing very aggressive actions toward police, you know, randomly shooting them, which of course some of those are going to get a lot more visibility because, you know, the news is trying to blow up the police to say that they're good. But I feel like the police are potentially, some of them are friends, right? They have a position of power. We're not changing that tomorrow. Uh, I would rather try and make nice, nice with the coppers than at this point being like, F you pig and like telling them all to go F themselves because as things devolve, I want them to remember their humanity. And 
you know, as, as much as I like the idea, you know, on the surface of defund the police, that's not how it works. And you do need some kind of um, peacekeeping force. The problem is, is that the cops are not keeping the peace. They're freaking tax collectors, they're harassers, they're abusers. And then the good ones, they're not even able to do their job anyway. And there's no competition. Nobody's ever talking about competition for the cops or ending the drug war. Those two things alone and ending civil asset forfeiture solved 90% of the problem with the police. Um, I don't know. Like, it's very, it's, it's very kind of confusing to feel like, listen, send in those, uh, you know, National Guard, bust some heads, you know, we can't just have everybody just filing out in the street and, and fighting each other. And I don't know. I just, I'm very surprised to find myself feeling that way. I don't want to fall into an old status trap, but I also feel like we can't be too idealistic right now because we have a practical, a true, like our, our society is crumbling before our very eyes in this kind of gentle, creepy kind of way. Well, I don't think like, um, apparently there's a rash of cops that are either retiring and they also, they're having trouble hiring people. Now, in in the long run, that's good because there's less, you know, tax collectors and revenue collectors with guns on the street. Um, but if there's going to be, they need to do, if they're going to be there, they need to do their jobs and they need to protect people. And I think one of the reasons why they're quitting and people aren't um, joining is because they're realizing how much power politicians have. And the politicians are the ones who, you know, in Portland, who say, stand down. And I mean, if you're a police officer and if you're just there to collect a paycheck, if I was just a cop and I was there to collect a paycheck, I'd be like, cool, I don't have to do anything. All right, I'm just going to hang out. But the ones that actually want to, you know, like join to protect people, you know, no matter how misguided that may be in the end, um, I, I can see how they'd be upset where it's like, well, these politicians are just absolutely killing us. But, you know, the way I look at it, too, is, I mean, I've had many interactions with cops where I've debated them and they owe it, They have this thing where they come back to where they're like, well, if you don't like the laws, vote, you know, vote for different politicians. And to me, all that they're doing is admitting that no matter who the politician is in there, even if they're an evil politician, Whatever law they pass, I'm going to enforce it. So it's kind of. They don't of, care. They don't yeah. care that they are, that they are like scumbags. I'm sorry to say that, but anybody who's just going to enforce, oh, whatever they say, I guess I got to do it. I mean, these people are primed to be murderers later on when the government says, well, now you got to kill all these people. And they all have discretion to not, uh, to not enforce certain laws that they don't want to. They all can be like, OK, I'm not going to enforce this law. I mean, obviously, if we ended the drug war tomorrow, a lot would be a lot would be solved. I mean, it wouldn't. Now, the black market's not going to go away. Like if you if you legalize all drugs, the black market's not going to go away because, I mean, we see that even in Colorado, there are still people who sell weed, you know, private privately. Ill, quote unquote illegally because and in California as well because they just don't want to go through the hassle of going through a store and you know well, they're also name. paying for the taxes that's yeah, it's and, not that and, they don't want to go to the store it's that they don't want to pay double right in, in Nevada in Nevada it's like double and everything so uh, but you would you'd still have some street violence but you wouldn't have police violence if you got rid of the war on drugs you wouldn't have bashing doors in at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, you bash my door in at three o'clock in the morning and you say, hey, this is the this is the police. You bash it. I'm going to expect that it's a home invasion because if I was doing a home invasion, that's what I would do. I'd be like, oh, it's the police. Stay, you know, stay calm. Get on the floor if I was doing a home invasion. So, I mean, if they come bashing through my door, I'm shooting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start shooting because I don't know that it's the police or not. They need to stop doing that. And, you know, it's I, I mean, and what's funny is a lot of them enjoy it. I mean, I, I did a this huge thing looking into the Louisville Police Department even before the Breonna Taylor thing, because there were 
child rape charges against against officers in that department. And I was writing articles about that. And it seemed like to me, just from art interviews that I was reading with police there, and especially the ones that were doing like the uh, the SWAT raids, they love it. I mean, they get off on it. I used to. Well, they've date- been watching a lot of movies. You know what I mean? Those idiots are watching all this crap on Hollywood. They're like, oh, bad boys, bad boys. I dated a D. I dated a DEA agent. She really? was, yeah, she was like, I, she's like, probably the most exciting thing I do in my life is being the first one through the door. Wow. Okay. Well, I okay. guess that's something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, I've seen this attitude up front, you know? So I mean, I would like, you know, and I've, I've written articles about this, how to fix the police. Okay. The police are, they have to follow the non-aggression principle. They can't initiate violence. They can only react, you know, they can only if, if violence is against them or against somebody else. And also I think the easiest way for policing is if you look at response times, police show up to stop a crime less than 5% of the time. Okay. So it's basically they're historians. They show up and they're like, okay, oh, you got killed. Okay, that's good. Or, oh, you got stuff stolen from you. Okay, we'll take down your information. You won't hear from us again. Police should be like fire department, should be like the fire department. They should stay in the precinct until there's a call that they're needed. They do not need to be riding around. I mean, there's no evidence that when they go into the hood, that drug dealing stops. No, it's just delayed for a little while. It's until they're until they drive through and they go in, in the car, you know, with a presence and everything. Just have them be like the fire department. So, yeah, I mean, that's one of the e- two of the easiest things that I, I could think of is, you know, police are just not allowed to initiate violence against anyone. They are to react if somebody else is getting hurt or if somebody's trying to hurt them and they just don't go out until they're called. I mean, po- cop, I mean, a uh, fire department doesn't go around looking for fires. Yeah, I mean, now you're asking the government to be other than what it is, right? And it's basically a beast that is its sole reason to exist is to just keep gobbling up more and more. So I don't know if there's ever an incentive for the government to stop gobbling. They love it. Why would they want to end their own existence? Um, They just want to get bigger and bigger. I think that's just the nature of it. Um, Well, I mean, I know that politics is downstream from culture. If the culture, you know, and the easiest one that, that everybody uses is when Barack Obama ran for ran for president in 2008, he was anti-gay marriage. Over the next four years, the public changed and 50, more than 50 percent of the people became pro-gay marriage. That's what the, the poll said. So when he ran in 2012, he was pro-gay marriage. When the cult, you have to change the culture. You have to change people's attitudes. If people's attitudes change, you know, and they tell their politicians, you do this or we're not going to elect you we're, or we're going to find somebody who will do this. You see that all the time. I mean, drug legalization is happening in certain states because the culture changed. You know, gay marriage up until I think it was 2004, 2006, it was in California was anathema. And no, it was way below 50 percent. and. It, why? Because of the black population. Black people are they're there for gay marriage. They they're to, they're basically conservatives when it comes to social values. So it's like, but once that changed, and the people were like, "No, we want this now." And the same thing with weed. The same thing. The culture has to change. If you're not changing the culture, and the left knows this, the, the left owns the culture because they concentrate on the culture. They put you know. We're going to put music out that's that's culturally left. We're going to have institutions that teach that teach teenagers that are culturally left. We're going to have culturally left institutions that teach your kids from the time they're three or four years old to be progressives. Right. So that's the problem, though. You know, I'm a singer songwriter. I think a lot about how musicians influence culture, how music can influence my own cultural outlook and everything and how powerful that can be. But as we're seeing right now, you know, cancel, cancel, demonetize, get them off this network. There is such a difficulty with all the censorship to actually reach people. You know, if I put out a tweet and uh, the overlords don't like it, nobody's ever going to see it. The same thing with my Facebook. They shut you down. They don't let people see your messages. 
I find the the culture battle to become uh, is it's a little bit more difficult. Now the cool thing is is that liberty is sort of counterculture, so they're essentially this produced gross thing, and that you are being part of the machine if you go along with it. But those idiots think that they're radical. Like, of course, Black Lives Matter. It's idiotic to suggest otherwise. But by hijacking that, now they have their, they're just, their different causes and they're completely manipulated and they think that they're being rebels. It's like, you're not a rebel. Literally every single corporation gave money for this. Let me, let me it's not give you, that weird. Everybody let, knows Black Lives Matter. We're cool. You know? Let me give you an example of how the culture could have been changed this year very easily. Okay. The right in this country has been complaining about the department, um, the Department of Education for decades, ever since it came in. The right is always complaining that the public schools, the government schools are indoctrination centers for leftism. So the government shut down the schools this year. And they shut them down pretty friggin hard. And yeah, it's kind of nice, actually. Yeah, They shut them down. And then. When it came around to fall and most of the schools were like, yeah, we're still not going to reopen. What does the right do? Reopen the schools so my kids can go back to school. They wanted the schools reopened so that they could send their kids to the fucking enemy. Yeah, well, they're just lazy parents. That's well, yeah. literally what it is. The mom and the dad are both working. They don't have time to raise their kids. They don't feel like it. They have important, you know, soap operas to watch and they just don't care. And that's a sad thing uh, because there is a great opportunity to open up people into homeschooling and to actually teach your kids more than, you know, what they get in the classroom. If I had a kid, I would not send them to a classroom right now. Not if they couldn't do it naturally. Like if they could go and not wear a mask and just be like a normal kid. Okay, fine. But otherwise, what's the benefit? A lot of that has to do with personal responsibility. When all of this started, I wrote an article uh, for Libertarian Institute that got actually, it was linked in some big articles in like major magazines who were writing about how people on the liber- on the liberty side were messaging this. And my article clearly said that this is a perfect example of why your finances have to be in order. Why, if you're living beyond your means or up to your means, you're, you lose. You're going to lose. I mean, look how many people have lost this year because they didn't have sa- because they didn't have savings enough so that they could pay their bills for 12 months or 18 months. That just makes sense to me. I mean, I was taught that from a young age, and I'm not Mormon. You know, that's something the Mormons like teach, you know, that um, have two years worth of food, everything like that. But I was taught, my uncle was just like, always have six, always have six to 12 months worth of bills. And, you know, luckily, you know, I work in a, in an industry that was deemed essential. But one of the, the, one of the first things I thought when this thing came out is you have to be conservative in your finances. And if you have a, a family and you have a house and you have cars, I mean, I know how many people I knew were getting rid of their third and fourth car that they didn't need this year. I mean, I bought a car off a friend for $1,000 because they had three cars and they didn't need the third one and they got killed in this thing, it got shut down and they needed $1,000. So I got a car for $1,000. And I mean, because I had $1,000 sitting around, but everyone else didn't, all these people didn't. And it's like, how can you, how can you live in this society and think that you can get away with, you know, you'd always hear the average family is um, you know, two paychecks away from being being thrown out of their home. I mean, you know, there's no more moratorium on like um, on rent and mortgages now. People are going to become being kicked out like crazy. I, I mean, you know it, what? But the other thing is, is that like, I kind of want them to because... For example, my mom, she has a, a three family home and she bought it as a investment. She's not some rich lady that just has tons of houses and stuff. And so one of the people there, they're purposely not paying because they don't have to pay. So it's like, I feel bad for the people that didn't save, but I feel worse for my mom who, you know, thank God did save. So she's not going to lose the house, but 
at the end of it, she's going to lose, you know, 15, 20 grand for the year of not having the rent at least. And then there's no, there's no resolution for that. There's no making those people whole. No, I mean, everybody, everybody's suffering this year. And really, I mean, when it comes down to it, it, the government caused it. Um, So there is, you know, the government should be making everyone whole. I mean, if if I was responsible for my next door neighbor not being able to work or pay their bills because, you know, I ran over him or something like that, I should probably and, and, and it was negligent on my part. I should probably be responsible for making sure that everything that he that person has is and the government did it to all these people. Now, I do. I think there's blame on both sides. I think that you should always be ready for an emergency because you never know what what's going to happen. But, you know, the government should be. I mean, that's twelve hundred dollar check. I mean, that was nothing. I mean, it, it was that's a drop in the bucket for what they did. And. They should have been. <laughs> if they wanted to do it right, they could have taken the universe, all the university endowments and uh, gave it out to everybody who uh, couldn't work. Yeah, well, God knows the whole objective of this was not to help people out. I, I honestly, I think it's a controlled demo. Do you think that COVID was a plan or do you think it was just useful idiot after useful idiot taking advantage of a bad situation? Well, I think it was... I don't think it was planned. I don't think it was released on purpose or anything like that. I mean, who knows if it, if it did originate in China, who knows I mean, what they did, but I think it, what happens is, you know, and, and you look at the world economic forum, the world economic forum, starting in the first week in June, started talking about a great reset. And one of the things they said was because of the way we saw how humans reacted to a virus, we can get them to do the same thing for climate change. That's the first thing they said. Oh, and, they, and, and by the way, this isn't conspiracy theory. This is on their website. They have a podcast that's called The Great Reset. They're talking about this publicly, openly. It's not like I'm like going into. It's not like I'm on. I'm on tour, searching. You know, searching the dark. The dark web. No, they have a website and a podcast where they're openly talking about how by 2030 you're not going to own any property and you're going to be happy. I mean. I mean, that sounds like um, something that they have been planning for a long time. And then this comes along. The government says shut down and stay home. And people are like, yes, no problem. We'll do it because we're scared. And well, remember, I mean, it was only, if you're scared, everything is excused. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and remember, it was only supposed to be for two weeks. It was just two weeks to flatten the curve. I think it's going to be two years, man. I can't even believe this. <laughs> These idiots are talking about. You've got uh, Fauci saying, oh, you're still going to have to wear a mask even with your vaccine, and then vaccines are going to be mandatory. I mean, I don't know how this is going to end up, but we'll we'll oh, end up finding out. Oh, it's I not going to – nothing's going to – nothing's going to change. I mean, it's – this is going to be – 50 percent of the population will be wearing masks five years from now. It's totally Oh, my it's God. Totally, They're so stupid. I can't take I, it. I knew this. I, I've been podcasting on this from the from the middle of March – and in the first week in April, I said that by July, because remember, it, back in March and April, they're like, oh, you know, this will be done by June, July and everything. I said by July, 50 percent of the 50 percent of the population will still be wearing masks. Yeah, I didn't know it was going to be 100. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it was going to be 90 percent. We're still going to be wearing masks. And I don't it, know it's, why they're doing it. They wear them outside. They, they wear them in their car. The it's it's clothing. No more fresh air. I, I'm sorry. Fresh air is just passe. It's clothing. I mean, you look at I mean, you have branded now. Companies have branded them. Um, that makes me so mad when I see that. Like, I'll go on a dating website sometimes, and there'll be a man in a mask, and I want to take his lunch money and like give him a wedgie. Like, I'm so mad about it because I'm not going to give you COVID through the freaking screen, dude. And you don't look cool. With a mask on, you look like a subservient slave boy, and I'm not interested. So on that happy note. <laughs> I mean, they're, you know, it's like they've demonized masculinity so much in the last, you know, decade, two decades, that, you know, men think that subservience is the way they should be. You know, and it's like, I mean, and I don't know what kind of woman actually, like, is attracted to that. I mean, it's just, it's just odd. I mean, it's just, 
it goes against nature. It goes against chemistry. It goes against science. It's like, it, it, these are the people of science and, you know, the, the science of, you know, I mean, pretty much every female I meet, I can dominate physically. It's that's what science is. And to want me to, you know, to emasculate to, or to say like, um, Oh, women are equal to men. And then they will be like, Oh, and, and physically too. And it's like, what are you talking about? What do you, yeah, the whole physical thing. It's like, listen, guys, I'm good at one thing. They're good at another thing. Let's relax here. Not everybody's got to be perfect. That doesn't mean that they're not strong chicks. Yeah. There are some women that can kick some guys' butts but for but, sure. But that's the outlier. And, and that's what these people want. That's what these insane people want to do. They want to make the outlier the norm in every in every situation. I mean, COVID is the perfect example. What's the survival rate? 99.7%? The outlier is dictating everything. The it's so annoying because then you just have to listen to it on Twitter. Well, this one got COVID. So what? Every time somebody's going to sneeze, I'm going to have to hear a freaking Twitter alert about it. It's going to be trending news. Like, why is this interesting? Unless they're dead. I don't care. I really hate these people. I mean, I really Yeah, hate. I know. It's, it's, it's hard to be positive in these times. But, um, but, but you know, can- but Biden got elected. So, you know, he's going to he's going to unite the country and everything. Everything's going to be kumbaya. No, he's horrible. And so is Kamala. She's horrendous. If people are worried about racist stuff, they shouldn't have elected those two dodos, which we all know that perhaps they didn't even elect them. Hmm. Where can people hear your podcast? And also, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about Monopoly on Violence. Okay, well, um, pod- the podcast is Free Man Beyond the Wall. It's, I mean, every, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, all those things. Uh, it's on free, it's a, um, it's on Lib. Uh, not even mention that libertarian institute i have my own page on there and everything um we put out we managed to get our documentary out the week after the the riots started <laughs> the first week in june uh, it's called the monopoly on violence and it's basically a history of the state what the state does how evil it is and a better way forward and really it's a history of anarchism we do and then you know, we get down into talking about everything from how an anarchist society would work to, I mean, we talk about mutual aid societies. We talk about every, you know, it's not, oh, it's going to be purely free market. We talk about mutualism and their volunteerism too. So um, it's it's on YouTube. It's available, the Blu-ray is available on Amazon. Right now it's in the queue to be approved so that you can stream it on Amazon. But as of right now, it's on YouTube. And really you can go, if you want to go to themonopolyonviolence.com, you can get all the links to it and everything. And there's a free download there. And then there's a 4K download for like 10 bucks or something like that. Awesome. Cool. Well, people should consider getting it. And uh, can they do it as a gift for somebody? Because, you know, the holidays are coming up and you don't want to get them some dumb thing. I mean, I think Bitcoin's always the best present. But, you know, maybe this could be an educational film to watch around the fire. A little bit of a bummer. Let's be honest. Maybe not exactly good for Christmas Day, but yeah. Um, nonetheless, these are, these are important issues. So thank you for, for all your hard work and for making the time on the podcast to come on and talk with us. I appreciate it. No, thank you. It's good to meet you. Awesome. Take care, Pete. Bye now. Thanks. The Tatiana Show has been brought to you by CryptomediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond. What's the point of all this technology without a little love in our lives? Our hosts, Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz have come together to bring you Proof of Love. Go to proofoflovecast.com. Hey there, it's time for the show. The Tatiana Show. Where you make friends and talk life and crypto. We gotta think and reflect. And use lots of intellect With our hearts When we work Together I know that it can be So hard out there Looking all around and saying That life ain't fair So that is why We will fight And stay up late at night 
listening to the Tatiana Show. Thank you for listening to the Tatiana Show. Please follow us on Twitter at Queen Tatiana or on Facebook and Instagram at Tatiana Moreau's Music. More episodes can be found at thetatianashow.com and make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. You are listening to The Tatiana Show. This show may contain adult content, language, and humor and is intended for mature audiences. If that's not you, please stop listening. Nothing you hear on The Tatiana Show is intended as financial advice, legal advice, or really anything other than entertainment. Take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Oh, and if you're listening to us on an affiliate network, the ideas and views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the network that you're listening on or of any sponsors or any affiliate products you may hear about on this show.